Hi, my name is Diane Reinhardt. On behalf of the entire Veil Remove team, welcome to our webinar on Unveiling the Truth. Is the Eucharist Christ's body and blood? Wow, we have a huge topic to, to go through today, and we're so glad to have Father Frankie with us. Um, I tell you, when our team was trying to get our film, The Veil Removed, off the ground, we learned so much about the beauty of the Mass and about the Eucharist. And we just want all of you to be aware and to know the gift that we have in our faith. So that's why we offer our free webinars and free TVR challenges and TVR talks. But we also, on our website, have fantastic resources that really dive into the beauty of the Mass and the gift of the Eucharist. We cannot offer those at such a great rate and all these free things without your prayerful support. We feel that every day and without your financial support, we would not have the reach that we do to give God all the glory without your help. So um, just please consider that. So, okay, before I introduce Father Frankie, I just want to let you know, we really became aware of Father Frankie when Marie, our director of marketing, was vacationing in Arizona and was able to witness the reverence with the reverent way he said mass and his joy of the Eucharist. And she went up to him. She said, you have to be in a webinar. With us. So I don't know if she gave you a lot of choice, Father Frankie, but we're so glad that you are with us today. And Father Frankie is uh, the parochial vicar at Queen of Peace in Arizona, the founder of Life Starts Here. And I think you're up to what, 800 billion followers on social media, something like that? No, not, not 800 billion. I don't think I have like a million on TikTok. 800, I think somewhere on there, you know, so yeah, well, the Lord is good. You know, it's definitely been a, uh, it's been a wild ride and definitely something I did not expect but you know follow the lord expect an adventure amen amen that's awesome well we're so so glad to have you here today and i tell you i know you've had a bit of a tumultuous road to the priesthood and i'm so um interested in, for you to share your story and i know there's so many mamas out there they're going to gain some hope for maybe their sons today so please tell us amen. how you join Oh, I'm so sorry. I oh, I forgot. Before we do that, okay. will you please start us with prayer? Oh, absolutely. Um, let us pray. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Abba, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Oh, Abba, it is called forth an outpouring of your presence to be upon us and every single person that will view this, that is with us right now. We give you the glory, for this is all for you. As we consecrate this time to you, we ask that your presence go forth upon and within our hearts. We just give you permission to move as you so desire. We thank you in advance for all that you're going to do and all that you have done in and through the gift of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Yes. So tell us about you that were, journey. Uh, yeah, um, I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can. Keep it brief. Uh, I'm honestly, I was really blessed to be able to grow up in a Catholic family. Uh, I was an altar server. And from a very young age, I just really had this longing and love for the Lord. And as kind of like time goes on, and I, I began to question a little bit of my faith, particularly in high school. You know, I think there's something about when you start seeing your friends who maybe aren't living the faith, they're partying, they're kind of doing things of the world and you see like a, a like a perceived happiness and a joy and and you can kind of sometimes question and I remember I was 18 years old and I was kind of just struggling interiorly with the reality of um, is this real is this true um, and I remember I uh, needed I think a little bit of a push to a certain extent of being to kind of move me away from the Lord and 
I received way more than a, a push. I think I was thrown as um, 18 years old. Uh, my dad, I come to find out, is addicted to drugs. And my dad actually kicks my mom, my sister, and I out of the house, transfers all the bills into my name, my mom's name, and stops payment. So we immediately had debt. Uh, we were homeless for a time, food stamps. It's basically like my whole life in one moment was flipped upside down. And I went from this place of, I want to live for the Lord. I'm struggling a little bit to, Lord, how could you do this? I've done everything you've asked of me. I, I've lived this particular life you called me to, and you allowed this to happen. And I was angry. I literally told the Lord, I'm done with you. I want nothing to do with you. And I left. I mean, I blamed the Lord for all of this. I blame the Lord, right, for what my dad did, unfortunately. And well, I just left. I left the Lord. I want nothing to do with him. And I basically jumped into uh, the world and all that the world says shall bring me happiness, you know, drugs, promiscuity, alcohol, that whole lifestyle. And I mean, you have to realize I was a broken, like my heart was broken, right? My dad just left and I could not deal with the reality of the situation. And so um, as I'm moving in the midst of the world now, I find myself getting a job as a bartender at a rock and roll Western mechanical bull bar in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'm just living the life. I'm living that lifestyle completely and fully. And every single day, I'm basically just trying to medicate myself to not deal with the pain of what was going on in the midst of my life. And uh, this bar was extremely popular. I mean, 3,000, 3,500 people, you know, every Friday, Saturday night. And listen, when you're a bartender, uh, you're making drinks and your head's in a well and you're just going for it. Like you just don't have time to crazy chit chat, move all around, you know, and right. If you don't know what you want, uh, sorry, next person. And I remember as I was basically living this lifestyle kind of for multiple years. And as I'm in the bar one night, Saturday night, one in the morning, I'm making drinks. And as my head's in a well making drinks, all of a sudden, like just out of the blue, I physically feel pushed back. And as I get pushed back, everything just goes slow. And I remember I, I like looked out. Um, I, I like looked out. I saw people like grabbing their drinks and like trying to drink them in slow motion. And the bowl itself is literally like up and down really slow. Like the patio bar, it's packed upstairs just completely packed and everyone and things are just moving really slow and i remember i had this moment where i started kind of talking to myself and i just said i have everything that the world says brings me happiness i have as much money as i need uh um, like this particular lifestyle and party lifestyle, drugs, alcohol, women. And there even was like a fame. It was so interesting. People would come up to me at the bar and they're like, I wish I was you. I wish I had your life. And I'm like, you don't even know me. And in this moment in the bar, it, it actually was the first time that I really was honest with myself. And I said, that I have everything that the world says brings happiness. And yet I am more broken. I'm more lonely. And I flat out hate who I am. And it was the first time in six years that I actually prayed to God. 1 a.m. in the bar, I turned to the Lord in prayer and I was like, Lord, what do you want with my life? I have lived apart from you for these past six years and I am worse off than I ever was with you. I'm back. What do you want with my life? And in that moment, I just like left. I quit the bar. And obviously, I had no idea what was going on, right? I just had this massive experience. I experienced like God's presence, his love, this realization that, oh my goodness, like I am utterly broken and I can't live uh, in this place anymore and I need the Lord. And so uh, I was really blessed to be able to have a, uh, a priest in my family, uh, Father Charles Canterna in Baltimore, Maryland. So I called him up and was like, uh, I have no idea what's going on in my life. I need guidance. I need counsel. Can I come out? And so I went out and I um, basically had this kind of spiritual boot camp. You know, I had no idea what really was to live the Christian life. And he was so good. I mean, it literally was this beautiful opportunity to uh, really experience the Christian life, to, to grow in the reality of what God was calling me to. And it never really was like, you know, married life or priesthood or vocation. It was just the fact of like, you are called to be a holy man of God. You're called to holiness. And what does that look like for you? 
And all these different things we were able to do really led up to confession. You know, I mean, obviously I was away from the church for my goodness, uh, many, many years. I think this is my first confession, definitely over 10 years. And I was definitely scared, but I knew this is what God was calling me to. And I'll never forget, I um, was in a small little room uh, and he was on one side, I was on the other side. And he gave me a huge crucifix and he just said, don't take your eyes off of Jesus. Just say everything to Jesus. And for two hours, I just poured my heart out to the Lord. I bared my soul probably for the first time. I was so raw and real. And I was definitely scared because I was scared the Lord would reject me. I was scared the Lord would say like I wasn't good enough, you know. And at the moment of absolution, I mean, I physically experienced, right, at like I absolve you from your sins, like just this weight, like chains broken, fallen off. This weight that I was carrying was just crushed and I was free, um, physically experiencing freedom, emotionally, spiritually. And I truly felt the Lord looked upon me in that moment with like great delight and was like, my son, I find no fault in you. Get up and sin no more. And after this experience of, of God's mercy and his love in the midst of confession, I went back to Arizona and I literally was like, Lord, I want to live for you. I don't care what it is. You want to be a priest? Amen. You want me to be a married man? Amen. I don't care. I'll do whatever you want. And because I quit the bar, I had a lot of time. So I actually started going not only to daily mass, but I would go to adoration every day. So I would place myself in front of the blessed sacrament, right? Like Christ himself truly present. And I would spend hours, like three, four, sometimes five hours a day, just right before the Lord Jesus in the blessed sacrament. And I even would like bring food and like go outside, eat my food, go back in. And I was like, I'm camping out with you. And I basically had one question that I would ask the Lord every day. And the question was, what do you want with my life? And I mean, I literally was like, I'm not leaving until you tell me. And like, you didn't tell me, fine, I'm coming back tomorrow. And I kept coming. And around two months uh, of continually asking the Lord that question and pushing in, um, I remember uh, I was actually talking to, to Father Chuck on the phone and uh, I was outside of St. Timothy's Catholic Church, which was kind of the, the place where I was really discerning my vocation at the time, just what the Lord wanted for me. And as I was talking on the phone with him, I just like completely felt the power of the Holy Spirit come upon me. Um, and I started crying. And in that moment, I realized like in my spirit, the Lord was calling me to be his priest. But I didn't say anything to Father Chuck at the time. I kind of waited. And as I got off the phone, I went back into the chapel. And I remember I have a Bible in my hand and I go before the Lord in the blessed sacrament and I'm kneeling there and my eyes are closed. I'm crying. And I just say, Lord, I, I truly believe that you called me to be your priest, but you're such a loving and merciful God. Is there any way you can give me a physical sign? So eyes closed have my Bible in my hand. And then I just opened up my Bible, open my eyes, look down. And the first words I saw were follow me. Matthew 9, 9, the call from uh, the ta Matthew, the tax collector from Boots of Follower Jesus. And uh, in that moment, I actually wrote August 8th, 2009, confirmation to the priesthood. And um, God's goodness and grace, blessed to be able to enter into seminary uh, a year later. And then uh, 2018, June 16th, I was ordained uh, to the Catholic priesthood of our Lord Jesus. Uh, and it has been just one of the greatest gifts of my life, a true call of, of mercy, no question about it. But yeah, that's a, a little bit of my story. Praise God. I mean, we're so grateful that God reached out to you like that and that you were open to that, that call. That's just such an amazing story. And again, gives so many of us hope. Um, I don't know that we're all going to experience something like that, you know, where you're just sure. back and everything's in slow motion. Yeah. But yeah. I think the sacraments of, of spending time in adoration and going to confession mm -hmm. and being mm -hmm. open to hearing God's call. I just think I, you're just such a great witness and we so appreciate oh, that. that. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I was, I was absolutely touched by the Lord. Like, I couldn't deny that. I mean, I, I knew it was the Lord and um, my heart was like, well, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to push into you, Lord. You know, I pushed into this life completely in the world and I, I hate myself. Like, this is not what I'm called to create it for. And so I was like, I'm going to push that hard. I'm going to push even harder into the Lord, you know? And so I'm really grateful for the gift of the church, the great the sacramental life. I mean, that was, 
that sustained me. The Lord Jesus through the gift of the church and the sacrament sustained me in that time of like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And uh, the Lord yeah. and his goodness really revealed yeah. it, made it clear. Awesome. So you also are the founder of a ministry called Life Starts Here. Yes. And I just want to share with our viewers a quote and then have you explain um, how that inspired you to start this ministry. Sure. So um, it starts, I came to a point where I was just sick and tired of living as if the blood of Jesus had no meaning or power in my life, as if I was just set free just to run back to slavery. That's not the gospel. So could you explain that and how that inspired you to start your ministry? Yeah. So, I mean, um, the first, the, the first thing that regards to that quote um, that was so impactful was the fact that I had to have my own kind of like realization and conversion of um, that, that this can't be the gospel. This is not what Jesus died for this reality of like, um, like living as if I'm dead, you know, and, and, you go to confession and then you go back to sin and it's kind of constant back and forth and there's enslavement and and there's fears and anxiety. And I was like, there's no way, this is not what Jesus died for. That's not the gospel. And, and I began to realize that I personally believe that lie that, you know, like, like our Christian life was just, well, you're just going to sin and you're just going to go to confession and you're never going to have any hope and you just got to kind of bear it and get through it and carry your cross. And I was like, Ooh, wait. you know, it's funny. It's, um, um, if I, I kind of had this, uh, real experience of like, if I don't actually believe that Jesus Christ has the power to save me and, and save me from my sins now in this world, then basically death is my savior and not Jesus Christ. That the only time I'm not going to sin is when I'm dead. Right. And that's kind of what happened. I realized like, oh my gosh, I'm nullifying the blood of Jesus when I'm choosing to believe that this is just what the gospel is that like sin is always going to be a part of my life. I'm never going to experience this full freedom and it's just going back and forth. And so in that reality, I was like, I look out in the midst of my people in the pews and at church. And I was like, they're like me too. A lot of us are like walking kind of dead. Like we we're around Jesus. We like maybe know certain things of the truth about the faith. Right. But yet we're like dead. And um, that's kind of what really began to start life starts here. You know, I just kind of really felt the Lord in my heart, uh, kind of begin to, to move and say, Hey, I want you to create a ministry for the sake of, of offer, offering opportunities of, of encountering me, like in the sacramental life, encountering me in real ways and not just encounter, but also to form, to assist people, to live the truth of the gospel, to live the freedom that Jesus Christ established. And so, um, that's kind of how it really began. And, it took a little bit of a turn uh, when COVID hit because when COVID, obviously, you know, my ability, our ability to kind of have in-person evangelization and the way in which basically teaching and walking with people radically changed. Um, I was in prayer one day and it was really clear. Lord just said, uh, my people are hungry. What are you going to do about it? And um, <laughs> I uh, was really challenged by the Lord to begin to uh, evangelize through digital platforms through social media through an app that uh, i created and just really being able to meet people where they were and where they could be and it definitely was a crazy journey because uh i did not want to get on social media i definitely had no idea what uh cameras and lighting and editing and all that type of stuff was i didn't even know how to make a post but i knew it's what the lord wanted and so i just kind of dove in and uh, it has been, uh, yeah, a wild ride. It's been crazy beautiful. And I think for me, um, I, I, I mean, I just did not know the power that God can move in and through through digital platforms and and people having conversions and, and experiencing and coming back to the Lord Jesus, coming back to the church, going back to confession, going back to the Eucharist and just realize, wow, Lord, this is powerful. And so I'm just like completely bought in. I'm like, all right. So yeah, the ministry has been now... Um, Really, it started kind of in person, then it kind of shifted to digital, and now it's basically a bit of both, of continually to evangelize through the means that God has created for the sake of, of the honor and glory of his name and the salvation of his people. So, yeah, that's that's kind of how it, it kind of became and morphed into what it is today. Well, God can work through us when we are open yeah. to hearing Amen. where he wants us. Even though, like you said, you weren't familiar. I, I don't run webinars, but here Maria and I are trying to, to work this out. And, you know, you just try to answer the Lord's call as best we can. Um, 
I love though, that you kind of flipped that, that how your belief in the Eucharist, which really is leading us into the heart of our webinar right now. And mm -hmm. I wanted to share two things before we really just let you go and let the Holy Spirit take, <laughs> take us where he wants. So the first thing is we did a random poll of 1200 people and over 60% yeah. of people did not know John six, or were only maybe partially familiar okay. with it. Obviously John six is very instrumental to our faith in the Eucharist. Yes. Um, and, and then the second thing is we're, I just wanted our viewers to know we're going to do this slightly different, whereas uh, historically we do a little bit, not rapid fire, but a little bit quicker question and answer. Um, I'm going to ask you to kind of dive into chapter or John chapter six and what we can learn from it and just kind of let you go. Um, I may sure. interrupt occasionally to clarify a point or ask a okay. question that I don't quite get. Um, but otherwise, just please let us know the significance of John chapter six for us. Um, well, I mean, I think one of the first things that we need to realize is literally this is the most explicit teaching that Jesus ever gave on the Eucharist, on his body and blood. Right. I mean, uh, this is like this is it. Like, the, what do you guys believe? John six is like where we're going to to experience and find that reality and um it's so funny i um i remember i've like had conversations with people and people have been like you know why do you catholics believe in the eucharist and that's actually jesus you know why do you believe that and um i'll just simply say three words jesus said so because <laughs> yes. ultimately that's what faith is <laughs> right faith, faith is, is like faith really is this gift of God to allow us to have confidence in who God is and what God has said, right? That I believe whether I fully understand or I don't, but the fact that since he said it, I'm then going to believe through faith, right? So that was kind of the first thing, like Jesus said so, right? And he said so in John 6. But the crazy thing about John 6 is the fact that this whole dialogue, this bread of life discourses was actually spoken in the context of the manna from the desert in the Old Testament, right? So um, whether people realize or not, Jesus uh, was a Jew, right? He was born in, uh, he was born in Jewish uh, family, his mom, his dad, Jews, in that reality, Mary, Mary and Joseph, um, his foster father, Joseph, Jews. He experienced this seal, um, the covenant of circumcision. He would go to all the feasts. He would go and celebrate the Jewish uh, the realities. And so Jesus um, lived and spoke in the context of Judaism because he was a Jew. And when he even like the reality of he starts preaching um, as he's getting older, it actually, he actually says like, I was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Like Jesus actually speaks about the fact of like, I'm going to speak to Jews, meaning I'm going to speak to them in the context, into the reality of, of, of the, of Jewish roots. And so I think that's one of the first things to recognize is that Jesus when he's speaking in all of scripture, but particularly within John 6, it's always going to have its roots in uh, in actual Judaism because he was a Jew. And I think that's the cool thing about the reality of our Christian faith is the fact that like I'm baptized into Jesus, right? By the power of the Holy Spirit, I made a new creation. I'm literally baptized into Jesus Christ. I have the same spirit that raised him from the dead. And because I'm a part of his body, Jesus' history, which is Jewish history, now becomes my history. And so Jewish history is my history. And so I think a lot of times in the reality of the Eucharist with John 6, um, if we don't know the Jewish context, if we don't know Jewish history, to which Jesus is speaking about, which the Jews are talking to him about, it kind of can be hard to understand. It doesn't really have a proper context. And so I think that's one of the first things we deal with John 6 is we kind of have to go back a little bit and begin to understand what's going on in regards to the Jewish people that are there. So in a simple reality, right, um, God created you and me and all of us for the sake of relationship, right? God desires us to share life with him eternally, not just now, but forever. And in God's goodness, he created us free in his own image. And unfortunately, in our freedom, we chose to disobey God, then enters into the world through Adam and Eve, and it creates separation, right? A rupture of relationship. And one of the consequences was death. Not just physical, but eternal death, eternally separated from God forever. Hell. Now, God, who has always desired for relationship, this desire never changed. And so God in his goodness 
chose to enter into history, chose to enter into the reality of our time to what? To save us. Like we couldn't do it ourselves. That was the whole point of God could have just left us to our own. We made a particular horrible decision uh, and we're going to have to pay for it. Or God in his goodness and love could choose to begin to rectify and reconcile us to himself. And he calls literally uh, the Hebrew people through Abraham and throughout the story of the Old Testament. And we find, particularly in Exodus, right? In the story of Exodus, we find one of the leaders that God raises up of the Jewish people, this people that God promised would basically be a light, would be the very vessel to which right, our salvation would come forth through Christ Jesus himself. And within the reality of uh, this leader, Moses, right, Moses was this, this like prophet that God raised up to lead his people. And during this time in Exodus, you basically have the Jewish people who are enslaved, like Pharaoh is enslaving them. He's their slave driver. And they're basically crying out to the Lord, like, save your people. We need deliverance. All right, We are literally enslaved under this unjust power. And so in a really cool way, right, the Lord, uh, the Lord basically speaks to Moses and he talks about the reality of um, I'm going to uh, establish a particular feast for the sake of you being able to be set free because in the part of the story, which is really interesting is the fact that like Moses went to Pharaoh and was like, listen, God is our God is calling us out to the desert to worship. We've seen three days and he's like, no, I'm not letting you do that. Right. So this is kind of the context of the actual plagues and the last plague for the sake of what, for the sake of actually setting right, God's people free. He says, he basically says to, to Moses that, listen, I'm going to go through the camp. And one of the consequences is the firstborn of not only of, of every home, but also of every animal will die. It's a particular consequence of the situation going on. And the Lord established a particular feast called the Passover, right? Where um, the Lord would basically, if certain kind of uh, things were met, uh, death would pass over that house and they would move into right? The reality of this new freedom and this new kind of like deliverance, right? So that that's like the Passover, um, as we'd call it, like the Passover of the Lord. And in a simple way, right? I mean, um, basically, there were kind of five things that were necessary in regards to the Passover that had to be done, right? I mean, the Lord was like, you have to get a lamb, like one year old, perfect, unblemished lamb, perfect. You have to kill that lamb, got to slaughter it, got to kill the lamb. And then you have to take its blood and you have to put the blood on the doorpost, right? Now, the reason why the blood has to go on the doorpost is because one, it reveals the fact that the lamb was killed. You can't get blood without that form of death. So it already was sacrificed. Um, and then the blood on the, the doorpost. And then you had to eat the actual flesh of the lamb itself, right? So you had to eat, right? It didn't matter, right? If you didn't like lamb, you had to eat the lamb. It was one of the actual prescriptions. And the last one was you had to do this in remembrance. Right. So make this a memorial. So every single year you are to go back and you are to do this in remembrance of what God was about to do. So as this happens, right, all all the Jews in this time enter into this beautiful feast. And as they fulfill all these five prescriptions, literally the angel of the Lord goes through and death passed over them. Right. So they didn't encounter the consequence that was actually rightly theirs. But God in his mercy and his goodness passed over through the blood of the lamb, this death and as they passed over, God delivered them, right? So literally they left slavery. Um, Pharaoh ends up trying to follow them. They pass through the Red Sea. And as they pass through the Red Sea, right, um, basically Pharaoh and all of like his soldiers, they follow and the waters come back and they die. And it's a really interesting thing because in the moment of the Passover is the fact of Right. That like God is delivering his people from the slavery of Pharaoh. Right. Which is this kind of context of like sin itself is kind of our slave driver. You know, we we are under the slave uh, slavery of sin and God and his goodness delivers. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because in the reality of the story, in the context. So Moses is the leader. He's leading his people through the Red Sea. Now they're in the desert. You see, the promise of the Lord was that they were going to get them to the promised land. Just because God delivered them through the Passover, 
right? Uh, they weren't finished yet, right? So, so God, in a simple way, in the reality of Moses, he creates this exodus, this mass exodus, right? Which literally an exiting from slavery into a place of new life and relationship with the Lord. And as they pass the Red Sea, they're now in the desert. And in the midst of the desert, right, they're now going to what? The promised land. God himself said that he would lead them to a place filled with milk and honey, this beautiful promised land where he would be their God, right? And they would be his people. And in the midst of the pro- in the midst of the, the desert wanderings, right? Because again, once once they're freed from slavery, they now are actually back in relationship in a new and a beautiful way, and they're walking with the Lord. So in this context, right, there's a reality of God feeds his people at this time with manna where God actually rains down heavenly bread to feed them for the sake of food for the journey, to nourish them with bread from heaven, to assist them to continue to be faithful to him in the midst of the desert until they actually enter the promised land. So for for Jews, right, Jews began to recognize and realize that this was like this Moses, right, um, as their leader, was kind of the beginning of what God ultimately was going to do. It was like a foreshadowing, right? Because it wasn't the complete, uh, it wasn't the complete actual salvation of God's people, right? So this again was like this beautiful kind of begin to reconcile, but sin still existed. There wasn't full reconciliation with God, but it was a foreshadow of what God was going to do. And so Moses is this prophet and, and this really unique thing. He, as they enter into the promised land, um, he kind of prophesies in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18, where he says, God will raise up a prophet like me in your midst from your own kin, and it is to him you shall listen to. And so every single year, the Jews would enter and enter into Passover. They would remember what the Lord did. They would grow in deeper relationship with him, but they always were waiting for the actual Messiah right? The one that would fully liberate them from sin and enter into full reconciliation, right? And they were looking for a new Moses, right? So to Jews, the Messiah was going to be a new Moses, which means there's going to be a new Moses, then there's going to be a new Exodus. And if there's a new Exodus, there has to be a new Passover. If there's a new Passover, there has to be a new manna and a new promised land. So for Jews, we're kind of moving into the time of Jesus, we're recognizing that like, this is what they're expecting. They're actually expecting the Messiah to be like another Moses, which means Moses is going to do, the new Messiah is going to do signs like Moses did. All right. So that's kind of the context right now that we move into John six. Um, if that kind of, again, I kind of, there's so much more, uh, but I think it's just, I think that context is huge just to recognize that um, Jews during the time of Jesus Right, we have lived this reality of longing and waiting for the Messiah, the one that would fully liberate them, not from Pharaoh, but from sin. And the way in which God delivered his people through Moses in the desert with Pharaoh is the same way that God would begin to liberate uh, his people from slavery of sin. And so that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for the Messiah, who to them was going to be a new Moses prophesied by Moses himself. Um do that like you've been you you've been talking about the passover and and the exodus so Mm -hmm. before we dive more into john six because i love that context how how you put everything into context but can can we just look at maybe how yesterday's passover and our jewish roots then connect to today's catholic mass and and if you can weave john six in they're great otherwise we can go to john six after this i just am curious about this how the Passover um, stays Catholic Mass. Yeah. So um, um, so I think, so first off, one of the, the realities that's going on is the fact that, so when, uh, when you have, uh, when Jesus is actually walking throughout the land and you have John the Baptist and he points to Jesus and he says, behold the Lamb of God, the old him who takes away the sins of the world, right? So, um, John in that moment is basically telling everyone around them, right? So this is Passover language, right? Behold the lamb, right? The lamb of God, right? Because again, in the Passover, it was the unblemished lamb, the perfect lamb by the blood of the lamb, right? That death would actually be passed over and they'd experience life and freedom. And so, and again, there's this promise of that there would be 
this new the Messiah would actually what? He would inaugurate a new Passover, which means there has to be a whole new lamb. But um, it could not be the blood of goats. It could not be the blood of bulls, right? Because th that blood is not sufficient to be able to actually free man from eternal death, sin itself, physical death, but not eternal death, right? The reality of separation. And so there's this huge reality that as um, Jesus begins to identify himself as John the Baptist, like proclaims that he's the Lamb of God, he begins to identify himself. And the moment he actually fully identifies himself as the Lamb of God is actually Passover itself. So I think a lot of people forget that the Last Supper, right, like a Holy Thursday, was a Passover meal. Um, it's really clear within scriptures, like the Lord even says within Luke, that I have longed to share this Passover with you, right? So this is that Last Supper is a Passover meal. Right. It's actually right after the the lambs would be sacrificed uh, in the temple. And and so in that context, what's going on is the Lord, the Lord Jesus at the Last Supper. Normally, a part of the Last Supper is they're going to what they're going to remember and call to mind what God did in deliverance of his people back in the Exodus, back in the Old Testament um, through the particular sacrifice of the Passover lamb. But God begins, Christ himself inaugurates a whole new Passover, right? If he's the, and this is the whole thing, if he, the one thing in John 6 that he's basically kind of alluding to, which we can get to is the fact of like Jesus begins to elevate and begins to show the Jews that I'm the new Moses. And if I'm the new Moses and then I have a new Exodus and if there's a new Exodus, there has to be a new Passover, right? And so that's kind of the context that's going on is the fact that Christ himself would inaugurate a new Passover, right? A Passover that wouldn't be the blood of the lamb, but it would actually be his own blood, his own body, that he would be the very lamb that was slain, right? Christ himself, right, is perfect. He's perfect. So, so again, remember the context of the reality of the Passover. You have to have five things. One, it has to be perfect lamb, unblemished. You have to kill the lamb. The lamb then has to be completed to put the blood upon the doorposts or the blood has to be poured out. You then have to, um, you have to eat the lamb and do this in remembrance, right, as a memorial. And so if you begin to look at the Last Supper of what's going on, Christ himself begins to institute a new Passover, where instead of talking about the lamb, he now refers to the, the actual sacrifice as his own body and his own blood, where he takes bread, he takes wine, and he actually uh, inaugurates in this moment, like, this is my body, this is my blood, given up for you. Um, and... What's interesting is the, the the one thing that I think people don't recognize is um, you have to see the Last Supper and Good Friday, the day of the actual crucifixion, in connection, right? Because for Jews, the Passover was not just a meal. It was a sacrifice first. Then it was a meal, right? It was a sacrifice of the lamb for the sake of freedom, for deliverance. Uh, and then they had to partake of that forgive of that actual meal itself. And so... For, for a Jew, for all the reality of, of even the apostles at the Last Supper, when he's at Passover and he's beginning to really kind of speak that I'm the new Passover lamb, they're realizing that, well, if you're the new Passover lamb, you're going to have to die. Like, you're going to have to die, right? And, and from there, at this kind of Last Supper meal, he then moves into the reality of what? He gets captured and he, he literally does what he said he was going to do, that he was going to give his body, he was going to give his blood, right? And he offers his life for us uh, in connection then uh, upon the cross. And again, the Lord said at the Last Supper, do this in remembrance of me. And so in the gift of the reality of the mass, what's going on is the fact that we are actually, every single time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, his body and his blood, we are doing this and we're commemorating what he did and we're partaking right, in the reality of what God said, this reality of that this is my body, this is my blood, and this body and blood, if you partake in, is actually going to be able to not only save you from your sins, but raise you to new life. Uh, and so Christ himself instituted the gift of the Eucharist, instituted this new Passover, instituted this gift of the new covenant for the sake of us experiencing the fulfillment of what God began doing by saving his people um, in the Old Testament, ultimately now in Jesus Christ through the gift of the Holy Mass as well. So, so and then where Moses, no, absolutely, that completely cleared that up. I, I love the um, 
the con contrast and comparison of, of the two, the Passover and the Mass, and how that connects. Um, but also, you know, we say that Moses led us out of slavery and into the promised land. Didn't Jesus then also by his death and resurrection open to mm -hmm. heaven? It, would that be kind of a, another yeah. comparison of the two? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, so again, being able to understand kind of the, the Jewish history of the fact that like you went from God delivers his people through Moses, uh, Passover, wilderness, and then move into promised land. Well, so to then the reality of Christ himself, the new Moses, institutes a new exodus through a new Passover where he is actually the Passover lamb, right? Who's offering his body and blood. And through this sacrifice, right? Which in the Old Testament, death passed over, but but it did not actually grant the eternal life. It now in Jesus Christ, through his blood and the partaking of his blood, it began to reconcile man with God once again, meaning that God now or that man now has an ability to have relationship eternally with God, sins completely being able to be forgiven. And so the the interesting part is promised land, the new promised land properly, well, is heaven, is heaven itself. But just like the Jews who spent 40 years in the desert wandering until they got to the promised land, so too we who have been delivered and freed by Jesus Christ, right, by the new Passover, just as the Passover freed the Israelites, so too the Passover of Jesus Christ uh, through his body and blood sets us free. Well, we're not in the promised land yet. Neither were they. And so we have, are still journeying on this earth in the name of Jesus, to be faithful to him for the sake of experiencing the fulfillment and the fullness of the promise, which is heaven itself. And so we're in the state of journey. And that's kind of what we talk about. Like right now, we're kind of in the desert wilderness, so to speak, which is really beautiful to understand of like, we're going towards the promised land. Like my home, your home is heaven. Ultimately, Jesus Christ has literally recreated us by the power of the Holy Spirit to be citizens of heaven. And so we're not fully there yet, but that's the promise. That's where we're going. And so that's kind of the, the beautiful context, understanding the reality of like the manna from heaven, right? Of like the, the fact of manna in the Old Testament was for assisting like them to have food for the journey, to, to actually have a, a heavenly nourishment, to be faithful to the journey of God himself, and that God would fulfill the promise to them that not just deliver and free, but enter into complete new life in this promised land. So too, then, if everything continues to follow, and we see in Jesus who literally gives of his body and blood, the new Moses, new Exodus, now we're in the desert wanderings, we're not in the promised land fully, so then there would then be the context of there would have to be a new manna. There would have to be some new manna that God desires to feed us with for the sake of fulfilling and assisting us to be faithful to him in this world for the sake of being to eternal life. And so, yeah, like we're journeying, like... It is um, the promise of the promise of, of, of heaven is given to us in Jesus. But I still have to wake up every single day in shoes in the midst of my struggles, in the midst of my sufferings, in the midst of the difficulties, in the midst of the evils in this world to choose Jesus Christ. To say, no, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you no matter what. I might not get it. It doesn't matter. I'm going to choose to believe in you. I'm going to choose to be faithful to you. Um, and so that's that's a that's a part of the reality of what's going on in the Christian life is, um, you know, so. So then kind of getting back to John six, he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And yes. of course, Jews of that day would be like, wait, what? And he obviously, you know, a lot of followers left kind of like today, a lot of people, a majority of Catholics do not believe in the true presence, cannot accept that. Um, how would you invite people back and to help understand that true gift that we have. I mean, so, so there, there first is the reality of the within, like within John six, um, which I think is really important for people to realize is um, the issue is not understanding. Like the Jews understood what Jesus was talking about. It was really like they, they totally understood because, again, they're listening from a Jewish context, right? John 6 is all based on the bread that came down from heaven. It's all based in the reality of the manna. You know, it literally starts off with it says like in John 6, the Passover is near, right? So the Passover is really, really close at this time. 
And then all of a sudden now there's the multiplication of the loaves and the fish and Jesus feeds the 5,000, right? Which is kind of the foreshadowing. And uh, the Jews who see this sign actually say in John 6 that this is the prophet that Moses foretold, right? So they're automatically being like, this is the new Moses. This is the new Moses. It says it right there. And it actually is interesting. It says they want to carry him off as king. And Jesus like leaves and he like kind of goes to the, the mountain to pray by himself. Um, and as they kind of basically find the Lord again, they, and they ask him, right. They simply ask him to like, what sign can you do? Like, what can you do that we would believe? Right. So, so again, the Jews actually went to Jesus and they're like, what sign can you do for us that we can believe in you? And they then said, our ancestors ate manna in the desert. What can you do? Right. So they automatically. Right. So the Jews experience kind of the encounter that's like like the sign and wonder from Jesus Christ by the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. this this is the one This has to be the one. This is going to be the new Moses. And they automatically know if it's a new Moses, there has to be new manna. And so that's what they reference. They're like, like, what sign can you do that we would believe? Right. So it's always been about belief. And Jesus begins to basically speak to them about the fact of like it, it um it was not your ancestors that gave you the manna but my father in heaven but yet this right that you they ate the manna died but the bread that my father will give will, will well up to the life for the world to come and that's when jesus basically like drops this beautiful bomb where he says i am the bread of life like i am the bread of life you know though your ancestors ate and died whoever eats this bread shall live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. And there's this interesting line the Jews say. The Jews say, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And the question, first and foremost, is actually we have to recognize the fact of it's kind of a question based on identity. You see, they saw Jesus as a man. No man would have the power to ever be able to offer his body and blood. No man would ever have that ability and even claim the fact that like his body and blood, right? And also this reality of like, yeah, I can do this in the midst of wine and bread and I'll transform it into my body and blood, right? Like what, like what man can do this? You're right. No man can. Exactly. No man has the ability and the power to do this, right? But yet, unless Jesus is God, now there's something different. Right. Because Jesus constantly claimed divinity. The fact that like he just wasn't a man. He was actually God himself. Right. He was a son of God. And if he's God, he then has the power to do what he says. And so for so many of the Jews in this time, when he actually says, he's like, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood as life within them. And I shall raise them on the last day for my, 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 my body is true food and my blood is true drink. You know, and as he's saying this, right, what's going on in the re reality is the fact that they they don't believe um he actually says to them um some of you don't believe in what's actually being said and so that is the context first and foremost is the fact of belief and um and in the context of belief like that's that's where so much of our faith is necessary um which is why i kind of began this the fact of jesus said so Right. Why Jesus said so, because that's the first preliminary reality is the fact of faith um, is Jesus actually said so, because that, that's what's going on in the sense of John six. And that first foremost is he's challenging them. Right. Like, do you believe? And they're like, literally, this is too hard to understand. I can't listen. I'm offended by the fact that you would even do this. How can some man give us his flesh to eat? And when he turns to Peter and he actually says, like, well, should you also leave me, too? Because he kind of in the context in the Greek is more like. Well, why don't you leave? Like, why don't you leave? Everyone else is leaving me. Like, why don't you leave? And which is a really interesting thing because uh, a lot of people don't know this, but this is actually the only time in scripture that people left Jesus because of his teaching. Like the first time, right? Yeah, like the, the people left. Like Jesus, they left Jesus. Yeah, like they abandoned Jesus because of his teaching, right? People abandon Jesus because of the suffering that will endure by the cross and the fear of that, but not a teaching. And it was the first time. And so... And again, Jesus like holds firm and he's like, no, sorry, I'm not like, I'm not compromising on this. You can leave. But as he turns to Peter, the interesting thing is Peter responds via identity. He's like, Lord, I have come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. 
Because that's what it's first based on is the fact of like, I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe that you are God himself. And if you are God and you are telling me this, then you have the power to actually do this. I might not fully get every single thing, but I know who you are and that is enough, right? And so that's the first realm of the reality of our faith in the Eucharist is faith that Jesus is God. Like you're the Lord, like you are the savior of the world. And you, in your goodness, have said that you will feed us with your body and blood. And in this body and blood, we will have life and you'll raise to the last day. I might not fully get how that's going to work out, but I have to realize that you said this. And if you said it, then I need to believe it. That's the first, that's just the first thing, you know, so it's a real challenge. So again, it, that's a real challenge. Christ himself challenges every single person with that is, is in the reality of faith. You know, will you begin to believe that I'm actually God, um, that I'm not just a man, you know? It's so easy sometimes for us to believe that through God's word, he made creation. Through mm-hmm. Jesus's word, he healed a blind man. Through Jesus's mm-hmm. word and commandment, he healed a leper. By Jesus's word, his body and blood became our food. Oh, wait, mm-hmm. no, not that one can't believe that one, you know, and, and I don't mm-hmm. remember anybody at the last supper when Jesus said, this is my body. Nobody said, mm-hmm. eh, not really, it's really actually a piece of bread. You know, mm-hmm. everybody, I think yeah. at that point seeing how he works and it's different. And mm-hmm. we do have to well, rely on that and that belief. Well, that's again. So again, you, they might not have fully understood what was going on. Cause again, the, 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 the context of the last supper has to also be seen the reality of good Friday. Right. So, so that like the last supper made a lot more sense to probably John, right. As he's literally watching the Lord Jesus in flesh, his words of the last supper, but everyone right. That was there believed who he was like, no, you, you're, you're the son of God. You're, you're, you are the Lord, you are the Messiah. And so regardless of whether I get it or not, I'm going to base my life on you and your word. And that's what faith ultimately is. Faith ultimately is this confidence that God gives in who he is and what he has said. That's the context of it flat out. Right. And that's what's going on with the, like, yeah, like no one's at the last supper questioning that because they don't question him. That's the thing. They're not questioning him because they know who he is. And that's sufficient for them to begin to literally trust what he says because they know who he is, which is why so much of a conversion in our lives of the Eucharist first has to be a conversion to the reality of who Jesus is, a savior, the Lord of my life, that I'm willing to give everything for him, that I trust him, that he'll save me, that his word is life, that his word is truth. That he is the way and the truth and the life that no one outside of Jesus Christ will I be saved, right? That once we enter into this and all of a sudden it's like, okay, Lord, I believe that you are the Lord of my life. I believe that you are my savior. Okay, hold on a second. If you're my savior and your word has life, then now I need to actually begin to look at your word in a new context, right? It's really interesting. So in Psalm 23, right, it says like, um, begins like the Lord is my shepherd. There's nothing that I shall want. Well, when I say the Lord is my shepherd, what I'm saying is that my life is defined by God leading me and guiding me in how I live, how I act. And, and when I allow the Lord to be my shepherd, meaning I allow him to guide me in every single thing in my life, I'm not going to lack for anything, right? And so it's that same reality of the fact that like if Jesus Christ, who is the true shepherd, and I allow him to be my shepherd, right, means I'm allowing him to guide and inform my life with his actions and with his words, right? Because he's the Lord of my life. He's my shepherd. I'm not shepherding my own life. He's shepherding me, which means I'm following him and what he says. So that is, I think, one of the the big challenges in the reality of our greater conversion and depth in the Eucharist is, do I fully give my life over to the Lord and make him Lord of my life? And if I do, am I willing to begin to be challenged by his word and what he has said? Uh, in and through his and through scripture. So believing in his identity and listening to his word, I just I wonder if so many people have dropped off from our faith because his word is hard sometimes, just sure. like how we lost words. I, I'm just wondering, it just seems like so many people are leaving the faith. And do you have any idea why more today than ever before? 
Well, I mean, I think first off, unfortunately, it's kind of something that I, I, I fell into myself, the reality of when you make the gospel, when you water down the gospel and you live as if the gospel has no power in your life, it's not going to be, people are not going to want that. Like people don't want to water down Jesus. Like it's just true. People don't. Um, and, you know, when when we begin to profess that like we have the, like the fullness of the faith, profess the reality of Jesus in the Eucharist, profess the forgiveness of sins and Jesus Lord. And yet we're living like we're dead and we're in slavery. And, you know, you can look at people in the midst of the pews and it's like, man, if this is really Jesus, like if Jesus walked into the room right now, is that how you greet him? Is that like how you stand? Is that how you dress? Is that right? So when you have somebody like one in the church or even outside of the church, right. And they begin to look and see um, our faith, uh, our actions, our words, our life does not look a lot of times like we are living by faith. Um, and because of that, well, yeah, like that's that's going to have an effect on people. They're like, wow, I go to this particular church, right, or this Christian denomination, and I see life. I see joy. I see community. I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I'll be quite honest with you, right, our, our, like, our, our Christian brothers and sisters, right, like, man, they – have lived faith, I think sometimes greater with less than we with more, right? The reality of the sacramental life that we have with the seven sacraments and the gift of the church. Like we are so crazy blessed. And yet we live with more in a very weak way where there are others who have less in sacramental life, right? Where they might not, they don't have the actual body and blood. They might not have the gift of confession, the gift of confirmation, things of these beautiful gifts that God has established for his church. And yet they're living on fire. They're alive. They're actually living the gospel with less. And so that, so again, a part of that, I think is that's one reality is we're not living our faith. We're not taking it seriously. We're not taking Jesus seriously. Um, and, and the part of that too is the reality of like the hierarchy, which is one of the things of like my, my role of um, like, you will know that uh, Jesus is the Eucharist. Um, like you will know that I know with all my heart that that's Jesus. Um, Cause I know. And my, my, the way that I'll celebrate math, the way that I will move and, and move and walk and kneel and genuflect and just, I, I, I know, I know that I know that I know that I know the fact of like, literally, I should be dead right now. I'm literally touching the son of God himself. And yet I'm living and how am I even in his presence and what love and what mercy. And, but that's, that's a part of what I share with my people. Like my people know, they're like, I might struggle to believe, but I know you believe. And, and that can assist people to begin to enter into the truth in the realm of, of, of the reality of what's going on is, is so, um, yeah, anyway, I think that, I think there's like a lot of answers, but I think that's just one is, um, I think that's one, we're not living our faith in the way in which God has called and created us to, um, because we probably don't believe in our faith as much. Uh, and then I think two, this is real, it's unfortunate, um, We've packaged the Lord Jesus and the gift of our faith in a way that is super unattractive. Like, so for instance, if I give you an option of an or, so I showed you an Oreo bag and I showed you a brown paper bag based on looks, what are you going to choose? Oreo. Yeah. Right. But if I open the Oreo, there's nothing in there. But yet if I open the brown bag, you literally have gold. But because of the way that it was packaged, people like will choose what looks more beautiful. And I think the fact too, and the reality of the way in which we packaged Jesus and the gift of our faith at times, and because God is beautiful, but sometimes we don't actually reveal his beauty in the way in which we could live our faith and the way in which we could celebrate the mass and the way in which we can move and act and have our being in the Lord Jesus. And that affects people like, wow, like that's not attractive. I don't want that. You know, um, beauty is, is a beautiful full form beauty is a great form of evangelization and so i think sometimes in the midst of our faith we're like well we have jesus so like that's enough like we don't need good homilies or like music doesn't be that good or whatever we can kind of go through the motions because we have jesus in the eucharist and it's like sorry um that doesn't work because the majority of people don't even believe that's jesus you know so it's like i can't fall back on the fact that like oh yeah we have jesus so we're good like no just because of the fact that i have that i know that we have the living god right here in our midst to the gift to the Eucharist does not like lessen my responsibility to awaken my people 
do this reality and truth through the way that I live my life, through my own preaching, through the way in which I'll celebrate the mass, right? Like that is a huge part. Why? Because beauty evangelizes. And um, I think that's one of the reasons too, is we, we don't present the Lord of glory in all the glory he deserves and is within. Um, so I think those, again, I get, there's, I like multiple ends. I think those are just two, um, you know, not living our faith fully and then presenting our faith in a non-attractive way. Right. No, I, I completely agree with that. I, I sometimes look at people in church and they look very glum and, and I'm sure they're just thinking they're pious, but we need to show our joy and the the fullness yeah. and the beauty of our faith. So father, I cannot believe this, but we are out of time. And okay. I just am so, so grateful for everything you've shared today. I mean, I just feel like that connection to our Jewish roots. I, I won't look at mass the same and all those connections you made. Um, and just now I'm going to try to rip off that brown bag and show you the joy and the gold <laughs> of our faith. Amen. 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 <laughs> um, but before I have you take us out in prayer, I would just like to say a few thank yous. Um, first and foremost, to all our prayer warriors, we feel your prayers. We're so grateful um, for our financial donors. Thank you so much. Please remember to go on our website, theveilremove.com. You can find resources that will dive into what Father Frankie has shared with us today. Uh, to Marie, my, my table partner that always helps me through these webinars, our entire Veil Remove team, H&H, &H, who helps us spread the glory of God far and wide. We could not do that without their professional help. Um, and Father Frankie, you, I just really appreciate it. And I'm going to say a shout out to your mama, you know, just for raising you in faith and for being a joyful witness. So mm -hmm. thank you. And, and please take us out in prayer. Well, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Abba, you're so good. When we chose to abandon you through sin, you did not abandon us, but yet you sent your Son our Lord Jesus, into the world to suffer, to die, to be raised to new life by the power of the Spirit. And through the power of that same Spirit, you have granted us new life. And in this new life, you have given us your very body and blood that we may feed upon you life itself where sin begins to be destroyed and freedom begins to be experienced here ultimately to life eternal. And Lord, you know the heart of every person here. And by the power of your spirit, may you begin to enter into minds and hearts now to break down walls and hindrances of faith that you truly not only are a loving God, but present in the gift of your son, Jesus, who veils himself under the Eucharistic form. May all now who see Jesus, your son, in the Eucharist, may you grant a grace of new eyes of faith to see through the veil and encounter truly that this is the Son of God, our Savior, Lord, and Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us again. Uh, I am Diane Reinhart. And until the next time we meet, remember God loves you and God bless you.